Welcome to the Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, Strategies for Supporting Your Child's Learning at Home. Uh, this is a webinar series, and this is webinar three, PBIS, Responding to Behavior. I'm Stacey Rulison. I'm a consultant with the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Special Education, supporting the Michigan Alliance for Families, who is, is co-supporting this uh, webinar series. Um, I am a board certified behavior analyst and a licensed behavior analyst and uh, work privately um, supporting children and teens and young adults in um, interventions and most recently with uh, young adults and teens in, in social interactions. Um, I'm the parent of a 15 year old with Asperger's and participate on a variety of, of statewide projects. I support the statewide autism resources and training project. Um, among other statewide projects to benefit individuals with disabilities. So, Steph? Sure, hi. Uh, my name is Stephanie Dyer. I am a school psychologist by training. I've worked in uh, several, several urban and rural districts and ISDs. Um, I've also served as a special education administrator, an autism coordinator, and a behavior specialist. Um, I currently work for my MTSS Technical Assistance Center, which is Michigan's multi-tiered system of support technical assistance center. And we work to increase outcomes for all learners by uh, assisting educators with integrating both reading and behavior supports in a multi-tiered um, framework. I also work for another state grant called the Statewide Autism Resources and Training Grant, which provides uh, intensive training and technical assistance um, for educators um, and families. Thanks, Steph. Um, so we'd just like to do a couple of acknowledgements today. So as Stephanie just mentioned, the MIMTSS Technical Assistance Center um, that's co-supporting this project. Um, the Michigan Alliance for Families is a grant funded initiative under the Michigan Department of Education Office of Special Education and provides parent mentors around the state that support families with questions related to special, educating, edu special education topics and um, any questions that they might have in, um, in their child's education, they can contact the parent mentor. They also have a wonderful website with a lot of resources that are available um, by special education topic, a YouTube channel, and um, lots of resources. Um, also like to acknowledge all Michigan educators and administrator staff, um, families and children returning to school this fall. Um, again, we know it's a trying time for some and um, it's, it's um, challenging to transition back into kind of a, an environment where there's a lot of unknowns. So we just would, wanted to um, put that out there. Also, um, looking at objectives for today's webinar, um, we'll be looking at increasing your understanding and use of recognizing, reminding, rewarding, and reinforcing um, expected behaviors. Uh, we hope to increase your understanding and use of strategies for responding to challenging behaviors, and also hope to increase your understanding and use of teaching alternative behaviors to replace challenging behaviors with more pro-social behaviors. So in our agenda today, we'll do a brief um, review of webinars one and two. We'll also uh, cover how we encourage expected behaviors by reminding, recognizing, and rewarding them. Um, we also will discuss resources for getting uh, more information about teaching and reminding and recognizing and rewarding, and also um, about correcting, reducing, and replacing challenging behaviors. We also have some resources for your review, and we'll offer a brief survey at the end and, and talk about next steps. So we've talked about going back to school, and um, now that we're back in school, we're getting into new routines and new requirements, and we still are facing a lot of unknowns and probably some new challenges. So many of the strategies and supports that we're discussing throughout this webinar series hopefully can help with that transition. Your school, your school team can definitely help you with this as you have questions and concerns. We found, um, you know, in our home with our 15 year old with ASD, um, we are in a full-time learning environment online um, that organization is really key uh, to making things move forward. So we have a weekly schedule that we print um, the upcoming week assignments um, and it, use that as a visual to track what's completed and still outstanding. So this has been quite an adjustment, um, but has provided our child with more of a sense of control and in increasing his skills and self-management. So, so uh, before we move into today's topics, as Stacy said, we're going to do a quick review of the last two webinars. 
So if you've missed the previous webinars, they are available on the My MTSS YouTube channel and also linked on the Michigan Alliance for Families um, webpage. So a great way to recall the uh, foundations of PBIS, what it's really all about is with three words, prevent, teach, and respond. So I had them say them with me um, last time. So let's say them together again, wherever you are, prevent, teach, respond. Uh, next, we spent some time talking about routines um, and why they're so important. So routines provide structure and predictability and consistency. They reduce anxiety and stress. And once they're established, they become the manager of behavior um, for our kids, not us. Many of you um, identified some routines that you are either had in your home or beginning to establish in your home. During the last webinar, we talked about developing broad expectations and defining them into rules. Um, having expectations set up and clearly defined in a matrix like this provides clarity. So children don't have to just try to figure out what our expectations are. Um, it also allows us to be more consistent as parents and teachers. And the clear definition give us specific skills that we can teach and reinforce with our kids. And then lastly, we talked about actually teaching the rules and expectations. We teach them by explaining them to our children, modeling what they look like, having them practice, and recognizing their effort and their skill in demonstrating the expectations. So we're gonna go ahead and start with a poll. Um, in a minute, this um, a question will pop up on the screen for you to respond to. And the question is, what components have you started to develop and use in your home? And all of the components that I just reviewed, uh, reviewed very quickly are listed here. You can check as many as you'd like. I feel so excited to see the results. Excellent. So many of you have been trying a lot of, of the different strategies. So that's great to see. Thank you. So now we'll transition into some new material for today and responding to behavior. So we want to focus on responding to behaviors in a proactive way and in a way to promote pro-social behaviors. So this includes promoting your child um, repeating desired behaviors and behaviors that demonstrate rules and expectations. So this can be done through reminding of expectations to prevent unwanted behaviors, recognizing desired behaviors, and then rewarding those behaviors. Stephanie will discuss the responding to challenging behaviors in a few minutes, um, but that's when, um, when expectations are not being met through specific, in these specific strategies and replacement behaviors. So we mentioned the term pro-social earlier. So let's first define that for some context as we talk about appropriate desired behaviors. So pro-social behaviors are socially accepted behaviors that when, that which promote more positive and effective ways for children to interact with their environment and those in their environment. So this includes parents or siblings, peers, teachers, and others in the community. So demonstrating pro-social behaviors has been directly linked to social acceptance by peers, and teachers and peer, and peer relationships that are, um, provide opportunities for children to learn and practice um, social skills and pro-social skills. So examples of exhibiting pro-social behaviors are sharing and cooperating and helping and having perspective taking skills, being empathetic, um, feeling gratitude and giving compliments, being respectful, respectful and kind and so on. So pro-social behaviors can occur informally through relationships with peers and in peer groups and more formally in academics through exhibiting positive classroom behavior, enabling greater learning. 
So research supports the PBIS framework as a way to increase pro-social behaviors and reduce undesired behaviors. And they're linked directly to improve peer relationships, classroom grades, and test scores. So we'll talk about um, first reminding. It's really important the child is able to use a rule in context um, or in the appropriate setting. So reminding is all about preventing the behavior by providing the support before a routine, task, or activity um, to promote their success. So for example, um, we would remind them to wash their hands after they use the bathroom before they actually use the bathroom. So since the child already knows the rule, reminding um, does not require additional learning. Um, this would just be a quick activity with low effort as we are reminding them to do something that they already know how to do and they should understand what we've asked. Again, this could be in the classroom, in your home, or in the community. And by using reminders, we are setting them up for success and before they, they compromise a rule or exhibit an unwanted behavior. So let's look at some strategies for reminding of rules related to expectations. The first one we'll talk about is connecting the behavior to the rules or expectations prior to a routine. So the home rule might be, and I'm gonna do this through an example, the home rule might be, we pick up our toys when the timer goes off. So you might say, Allie, you're following the rule for putting away your toys when the timer rings, that's awesome. Um, the next one is referencing rules when the child is having difficulty following the rule. So for example, if Allie keeps playing after the timer goes off, you might say, Allie, remember we put our toys away when the timer goes off. What will you do next time the timer goes off? So you're, you're kind of prompting them into that response. So continuing from the prior slide with strategies for reminding of rules, we'll look at pre-correction and prompting. To remind of expected behavior um, before an error can be made, if you know this may be difficult or an error is likely, we can likely prevent it. Some examples are, Allie, I know it's time to play with your toys. Remember, we need to pick up our toys when the timer rings. I'll set the timer now. Dylan, I know you just finished your homework. Remember to cross what you finished on your class assignments list before you put your things away. So those are just two examples. So here are some examples of using different types of prompts before an activity. In this example, the rule for a student who learns line, online might be, the camera is always on during online math. So a verbal prompt might be, the camera is on, saying that your camera needs to be on during, online, during your online math class. Um, the gesture might be pointing to the camera and without saying anything, but just gesturally pointing. And then the visual might be a sticky note on the computer saying, turn the camera on as a reminder to prompt them along. So we know through behavioral research, it is really important to catch um, children doing things the right way. And this is a more effective approach than trying to correct mistakes or problem behavior after they occur it's important to really increase positive interactions with the child and acknowledge and recognize as soon as the rules are followed or behavioral expectations are met. Um, we should use very specific verbal praise when expected behaviors exhibited, such as great job putting away your math, your homework in your math folder. Depending on the child's age and what motivates them, you can also include or pair this with like hugs or fist bumps, high fives, or other expressions that you might use in your home but make sure you pair it with the specific verbal praise. So focus recognition should be used um, for difficult routines. This means when an activity or task is especially difficult, it is really important to recognize effort and following the rule, you know, immediately following the rule or expectation. So something like, wow, great job on finishing your science assignments. I know it took a lot of time and effort and you really worked hard on it. So, and that, so that can acknowledge that, that hard work and effort. The goal is for the behavior to become part of a habit and become part of the child's regular behavioral interactions or as we call it, the repertoire. So when we think about recognizing, it is a way to reinforce expected behaviors and compliance with the rules. So there are some principles related to reinforcement that we'll discuss um, in the next couple of slides. So when re reinforcement occurs, it's any time a behavior that increases or is likely to be repeated, it has been reinforced in some way. This is specific to the individual. So what reinforces one person may not reinforce another. What's reinforcing can be literally anything. It really, again, is an individual, um, it's up to that individual. So it can be access to a tangible, like a toy or a game or an activity or earning a reward. 
it can be some form of attention, such as verbal praise or a thumbs up or a hug or a look or a smile, um, or interactions with parents, siblings, peers, teachers, and other things that can be reinforcing to the individual. It can also be getting out of something or doing something um, that can be reinforcing, like an assignment, a chore, a request. And sometimes we see behaviors develop such as a tantrum. And for example, we just give, the, give them the toy so they stop. Um, because it, it's, it's harder sometimes for us as parents. Um, they have essentially just been reinforced for tantruming in this case. So we know behaviors that are repeated or, or that are reinforced are more likely to be repeated in the future. So motivation for reinforcement is also vital. If the child is not motivated by the reinforcer or what they are earning or working toward, they may not be interested in meeting expectations or following the rules if the effort is, way, is, is too great for them. And we'll talk about that in the next slide more. So reinforcement can also be intentional or unintentional. Uh, sometimes as parents, we don't think about that. And there are things that we do to soothe them or to stop a specific situation. And sometimes it's, it's, it stops a situation for us. Maybe it causes us irritation or something. So it's just easier sometimes for us in the path of least resistance, or so we think. But unfortunately, this can lead to more difficult and continued problem behaviors. So just as a quick example, my son kept losing his lunch money. I compl I'd complain and he'd just give me, and I'd just give him more money. So this happened over the course of a few weeks um, last school year. And he, the year before he had taken his money and there was no issue, it was, it, he had his money, he had his lunch. So in discussing it further with him, um, he said that he didn't wanna go back to his locker, that apparently his locker was further away from his last class before lunch this time. So I realized that I was only reinforcing his behavior of asking for money and, and, and not getting his money. So there was no consequence in him you know, changing his behavior. So I finally said, you have your money for the week. I'm not giving you more lunch money. And I didn't. And he started getting his own and, and he stopped asking. Unfortunately, he had to miss a day of lunch because he didn't plan, which was the consequence for not having his money. But it happened once and he does well with it now and it hasn't happened since. So. Um, so I, he's no longer has grief and need to try. So, um, it, and we know that reinforcement is more effective than punishment. And so, again, Stephanie will discuss this um, later in the presentation. So the rewards that we're gonna talk about then also need to be reinforcing. So we need to think about expected behavior and what is reinforcing for your child. So the, as a parent, those are things that you need to think about. What might motivate your child? So, and it's important to look, know a little bit more about what makes reinforcement uh, more effective. Um, and there are some considerations for deciding on using a specific reinforcer um, and whether it may be motivating to your child. We call this assessing reinforcer effectiveness and how motivating that reinforcer might be offered might be to them. This really, really matters when we're teaching a new skill or a behavior or maintaining a behavior that's difficult. Um, sometimes we think something is or we think it is or should be reinforcing, right? And, and it really isn't. If I gave my kid time on TV, um, a lot of kids love TV. Uh, many kids love TV. But if I gave him a time on TV, he wouldn't care. Um, there's nothing in that for him. But now, if I gave him time on Mario Kart after he finished his, his homework, I can guarantee you it'll get done because he cares about it. Um, so we can't make those assumptions, right? It has to be specific to the individual. So the first thing is value. So the value can increase um, without access. So the longer they go without a reinforcer, the greater value it has. If they haven't had it in a while, it's probably more reinforcing to them. If they have, they've had too much of it, it probably won't be reinforcing to them. So as an example, if the iPad is reinforcing to your child and they've had played it all weekend and you try to use it as reinforcement to get homework done on, mon homework done on Monday morning, it may not be enough value to them um, to, to work hard to, to, um, to actually earn it. So they've had too much of it. And we call this satiated on the reinforcer. Um, it gives it, um, give, it to, give it a few days, it, it likely will become strongly reinforcing to them again. So it needs to be immediate and delivered right after the behavior. This is really important if it's a difficult skill or behavior. So then we talk about size, enough of it to matter. So we want to make sure that they have access to enough of it so it's motivating. So if they have to earn 40 stickers to earn 10 minutes on the iPad, it may be way too much effort, right, for them, um, that, for them to exert the effort. If they had to earn 20 rather than 40 stickers, um, it may be more motivating to them. And then dependent, and only given when the expected behavior is demonstrated. So we really want to make sure that reinforcer is given under those conditions. So um, 
So like, one quick example I want to give is I was tra um, toilet training a young man, um, a five-year-old. And um, so what, we, what I did is walk back through these things with his parents, right? What's, what's a value? So he had a new DS that he didn't have much time, a Nintendo DS. Love this DS. So what we did is only limited access for the time we were training, right? Doing the toilet training. So it was a high value to him. So, and we knew that. And then we knew we could deliver it. And, and we knew that we would make the battery chart, make sure the battery was charged and that it would be delivered right after he went to the bathroom. So the size, um, again, it's enough to matter. So meaning, is he gonna have enough time on the DS? If we gave him two or three minutes, if he went to the bathroom, that's probably not gonna be motivating for him, right? It was like a 15 or 20 minute time frame he got to interact with the, with the DS. And then dependent, um, only when he went to the bathroom did he get this, right? So that was a contingency. And we put a big picture of the DS right in the bathroom so he could see it. And it took us maybe three days and he was, he was toilet trained. So um, we'll focus mainly on positive reinforcement, but we wanted to talk for a bit about types of reinforcement and punishment too. And again, Stephanie will speak more about how um, punishment is or isn't used. And I'll just talk about mainly what it is. So as illustrated here, any type of reinforcement, any type, whether it's negative or positive, increases the likelihood of a behavior increasing or happening or strengthening. Um, positive reinforcement is anything added to our environment that increases the likelihood of a behavior. Um, think about going to work and earning money. Usually this is pretty positively reinforcing for us because we need money to live, right? So we need to earn money. Or getting recognized for a good job. Your husband may be noticing a new sweater and making you feel really good saying, hey, that's that new sweater, that looks great. So you tend to wear that sweater a little bit more often because you've been positively reinforced. So negative reinforcement is not punishment and does not decrease behavior. Many people think this. It's, it too strengthens the likelihood of a repeated behavior and anything that strengthens, it, strengthens the behavior, again, is reinforcement. It, occur, it occurs by, in, by the individual escaping or avoiding something. And usually it's something unpleasant, an unpleasant consequence. So a quick example would be my CD seeing a speed limit sign. If I'm going 80 and I see a speed limit sign for 75, um, I want to avoid getting a ticket. So my, my, my behavior of driving the speed limit increases because I don't want to get a ticket. Um, I'm more likely to drive the speed limit in the, in the future. Or a child being handed a worksheet, right? And um, they have a tantrum and then they're sent out of the room. So they're probably gonna have more tantrums to escape work. So they've just been negatively reinforced. Punishment is anything that causes the behavior to decrease. This can be a look, a response, or something, some other type of consequence that causes this behavior. If a mom scolds a, scolds a teenager for coming in late and they stop coming in late, Essentially, this has served as a punishment for the behavior. So, because the behavior decreased. So, also what might reinforce one individual might be completely serve as punishment for another. So, just a really quick example on this too. So, you have two math students, same class. One math student, the teacher says, hey, what's 10 times 10? And the student raises her hand, it's 100. Oh my gosh, you're right, that's, that's great. You're right on, you got the right answer. And so the next child, same answer, same situation. The teacher's like, oh my gosh, yeah, you got the right answer. Well, that child's embarrassed and has, it, it doesn't, it, it is not motivating to that child, right? That they're more introverted. They didn't want that kind of attention. So they, the likelihood of them, it, again, volunteering to answer a question has just decreased. So in one case, it's, it's reinforced and the other case it's punished. So, and this is just a really quick example where I compared all three of them. So in this first case, positive reinforcement, a child is tantruming and mom um, stops uh, her phone call, hugs the child and the child stops tantruming. Um, so the child tantrums the next time when mom's on the phone. Well, the child was um, positively reinforced for tantruming and the likelihood of, of them doing it again to get mom's attention on the phone increases. Same situation, the child tantrums and mom ends the call, hugs the child, child stops tantruming. Mom was negatively reinforced to stop the crying and the tantruming by the child. So as that stop, mom, stops, mom escapes, right, that tantruming of the child. So that's negative reinforcement for the mom. So the same situation, the child tantrums and mom stays on the phone call and walks around, um, walks to the other room, and then the child stops. The child, in this case, this served as a punishment when the mom did not stop the call and attend to the child. So the behavior of, of tantruming went down or decreased. 
So it's just a simple illustration. Um, so we'll now transition from rec recognizing with reinforcement to reinforcing with rewards or reward systems. Rewards are given for effort in performing um, skills or meeting behavior expectations. We talked about reinforcement um, being specific to the individual. It is also really important to recognize whether public or private recognition may be, may be um, appropriate. So maybe in that math um, example I gave earlier of the student, that the individual who felt punished by the public recognition maybe would have loved it, right, and been motivated and reinforced in a private setting with that kind of enthusiasm and feedback. So always use verbal acknowledgement of the behavior. A non-example of this would say, be saying, good job. Focusing on the behavior um, framed up would be, say, would be an example, great, you did your homework with no reminders. So, and again, you can pair this with gestural um, reinforcements, for example. Um, such as a smile or a thumbs up. We also want to ensure a connection between the reward and the behavior. If we are expecting them to finish their homework, but reward them for clearing the table or something different, the reinforcement system would likely not work um, for finishing the homework. So we can also implement structured reward systems, and we're going to talk about that too. And I'm sorry I put two pictures on there. I loved them both. <laughs> so um, I know there's a lot going on on there. So, um, so let's talk about structured reward systems. Um, we can use something simple for a more immediate reward, such as first then charts, and we've talked about them in the past. Um, and I have an example on the screen. There are other types of structured reward systems too, and a common system is called a token system or token reward or economy system. And these terms are used typically interchangeably. So um, the idea of a token system is to delay a reinforcer by earning more immediate tokens or symbols that represent progress towards that delayed reinforcer. Um, so like following a rule, um, they might earn a sticker. So you might acknowledge, I see you're following the rule of washing your hands. Let's get you a sticker. And that can be exchanged then when you get enough stickers for the delayed reinforcer, which in this case, um, they need to earn 20 stickers for 10 minutes of playing Angry Birds. So, and you can kind of see on the screen where we I pointed out where the tokens would go and then the delayed reinforcer is the actual time on the game. So the, token, the tokens take on reinforcing properties and are more immediate. They're smaller rewards while well, they're working towards, that, again, that delayed reinforcement. So again, the delayed reinforcer should be pretty highly motivating to the individual and have value in the size that we talked about earlier if we, we are going to be expecting them to wait for it. And we also need to think about this as we set up the system. So how much effort's too much and how much of a delay is appropriate? Um, it's really important that the reinforcers deliver too, as we talked about once, um, once they've, they've um, met, that, met that task or goal. So token boards can be written that you can use an existing template from a website or apps or you can create your own. Um, this works for younger and older children and should be adjusted to their age. It can be designed around areas of interest if appropriate. And this is just another example, more examples of a token system. And I've kind of outlined on the left here where, um, you know, they can earn mar marbles. And once they get 15 marbles, they can be traded for $5. And when they've earned $15, they can spend it on whatever they choose. So just, and then they should get some, at least a couple marbles a day to stay motivated towards that delayed reinforcer of the $5 and then $15. And finally, I, as far as my slides, um, these are just some example of different examples of different types of rewards. Again, whatever is earned should be valuable to them, motivating and reinforcing to the child, so they're more likely to demonstrate the expected behaviors. Um, here we look at free or choice time, fun activities um, that the, the child might enjoy, games, swing time, um, time with the family, favorite toy or game, or using a structure reward system like we covered with the token board. So this is a video we were um, we were planning we, we thought about showing, but it is in the, um, the it'll be in the, the the slides that you receive after the presentation today. So feel free to watch this. It's it is a mom that set up a very simple point system in her home, but it's really cool watching her sons engage with it. So I'll turn it over to you, Steph. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Now let's go ahead and shift over to talking about how to respond to behavior that is not demonstrating our behavioral expectations. And let's just start with some reflective questions. So just kind of think, think to yourself here. 
Um, what behavioral challenges, when behavioral challenges occur, what do we do? How do we respond? Um, does it kind of depend on our mood? I don't know about you, but I am way better at responding to behavior when I'm in a good place and feeling good and in a decent mood. Um, do we have a plan for how to respond to behavior? Or do we find ourselves winging it much of the time? Uh, when my son was little, uh, I, he did have some, some large behaviors when he was little and I had plans for those, but I did not have any plans for the smaller, more kind of annoying types of behaviors and, and I just kind of winged it. Um, do we find ourselves then using punishment by default? Um, gotta get, sorry, there we go. Um, so let's talk for a minute um, before we start talking about how to respond. Let's, let's have some conversation about uh, the difference between responding to behavior with punishment and responding to behavior through a discipline lens. So most of the time we hear both of these words used to describe consequences that are more punishing. Uh, and we tend to use punishment when we just want the behavior to stop or to change, right? Um, a big challenge with the use of punishment is that it focuses on what not to do and doesn't teach what to do. And we talked a little bit about that during the last webinar. What we know from years of research is that relying on punishment can negatively impact relationships between parent and child and between teacher and student, for example, um, and can actually increase how often we see challenging behavior. Uh, there's something about our human nature that makes us feel some temporarily, temporary satisfaction with using punishment because it feels like we did something about it, meaning the behavior. And all of this, and often it doesn't result in the behavior change anyway, which is what we want in the first place. So if we're punishing the same behavior over and over, for example, it's not working. Um, discipline, on the other hand, comes from the root word disciple, and it means instruction. So by definition, discipline includes instruction and teaching. It's based on the foundation that behavior is learned and can be taught. Um, and like we discussed last week, we teach behavioral expectations just like we would teach reading or math by providing instruction, modeling, giving practice opportunities, and giving lots of feedback. And many times, um, as Stacy just was talking about reinforcers or rewards, those serve as feedback to kids to let them know, yeah, you're on the right track. That's exactly what we're looking for. Okay, so if we know this, why do we punish then? And again, I just want to throw out a few reasons because, um, you know, many of us have found ourselves in, in this situation. So maybe it's because how we were raised and that's what we know. Um, sometimes um, we're not sure what to do and we get frustrated, so we just default to it. Um, maybe we think a child uh, knows how to do it and they could if they chose to, and that frustrates us. And so we want to punish them to make them do it in essence. But there's one powerful reason why punishment still happens, even though we know the, some of the possible side effects, is that sometimes it works in the short term, like Stacy described. Um, with her example, um, with a couple of her examples. So we get caught in this, what we call vicious cycle. So let's start at the top and let's just say my child misbehaves. So I pay attention to him by telling him to stop. And because mu much of the time, a gentle reminder like that, please stop, um, tends to stop the misbehavior. So I get reinforced because it stopped. Um, and he's reinforced because he got my attention. But two minutes later, it starts up again. And I, you know, annoyingly give him a reprimand that's probably not as nice as the first one, and he stops. And his misbehavior was reinforced by my attention. Um, and I'm reinforced because it stopped and it worked. So now when the behavior occurs again, I attend to him with maybe some kind of mild threat of a consequence. And again, he's reinforced by my attention. And then we're just stuck in this cycle. So what do, we, what do we do then? So these things on the screen, um, correction and redirection, are what we think of as sort of first response strategies. So child makes a behavioral error. And we love the phrase behavioral error because it helps us think instruction and teaching versus punishment. And it helps us stay less emotional. Um, so the first strategy is correction. And what we do here is we first quickly point out the error. 
Like it's not, this is not respectful when you are yelling when your sister is online with her class. Or if we need to use more or less words, we could just say, we have to be quiet. Um, then we need to restate the expectation from our matrix or from the rules that we've developed. So remember, being respectful during online class means that we're all quiet in the background. Again, we can shorten that, like respect means quiet. Um, next, we reteach and we want to create a positive interaction um, because again, we're, we're viewing this as an instruction. So we could say, let's practice playing with your cars quietly or show me quiet. And then we're going to give positive feedback to close that loop. You were so quiet. That's so respectful. Yay, you. Great job. So you go through these same steps, um, whether you're using words or you could also adapt it to use pictures or gestures or whatever communication um, system or method that your child is using. So correction, again, is a great way to respond to behavior initially. The, the next one is redirection, which is actually quicker than correction where you restate the expectation. You know, remember being respectful is when, when someone is online with their class means we're quiet in the background. Um, and then tell them what to do. Keep your words and your car sounds very quiet or please play with your cars in the kitchen. Let me help you move them. And then again, we're gonna give them that feedback. We're always closing that loop with the feedback. Um, you were so quiet, that's so respectful, great job. So the goal for a correction or a redirection is to be brief, to be calm and to give the child an opportunity to practice. Um, another strategy um, that we can use is very much the same as we can, we can use signals or nonverbal cues. So uh, many of you may have um, uh, children who are using uh, picture systems of some kind, selection systems, um, and you could you know, hold it up and kind of point to the picture uh, to give them that, that cue that, remember, we need to be quiet. Um, you could do like in the picture, you could use a um, gestural prompt if that's helpful and your child knows that signal. And these are again just ways to communicate to our kids that like a change is needed here. Um, lots of ways to do this. So also we could provide choice. This is really a helpful strategy when redirection and teaching and the signals or nonverbal cues haven't worked. What we do here is we state two alternatives one being a preferred choice and the other being a less preferred but not an awful choice. We need to be okay with either one that they choose. So I might say in this example of the, the noise in the background, I might say, you know, do you want to play with cars in your room or with me in the kitchen? And when options are paired in that way, students will often make, you know, the preferred choice. So you pause to let them choose and when they make either choice, again, we're going to close that loop and give them feedback. So I might say, great choice, well done. All right, one of the most powerful high yield strategies that we have, even though it seems so simple and can be easily dismissed, is the use of a five to one ratio of positive to corrective interactions with our kids or students or really anyone in our life. Um, this means that for every correction we make to a child, we need to give them five positives, like put five positives in the bank. And in my role with the START project, we actually talk about a corrective also including prompts or helps, because especially for children with disabilities who are often prompted and helped all throughout the day, um, in addition to being corrected, it can really feel like constant criticism. Now, with that said, we absolutely need to correct children. And many kids need prompts and they need the help and support. Those are very needed, but uh, you can see here it's not a five to zero ratio, so it does allow for those things to occur. But that just means if we're prompting a lot, if we're correcting a lot, that we have to up that positive ratio because it's a five to one ratio. So for every prompt, I'm five attaboys. Every correction or every help, five you know, attaboys. Um, so when we use that five to one ratio, it helps everyone focus on the behaviors we want to see more of and focus less on those who don't, which has a nice side effect of building relationships. Uh, and on a quick note, um, positive interactions don't refer to our tone of voice or how sweet we are. So by nature, I'm a pretty optimistic and upbeat person. And so I thought I had this positive interaction thing, no problem um, in my family, in my home. And uh, one day my when my son was a teenager, he came up to me and said, why are you always telling me the things I have to change or improve? And I was like, yikes. And, and I, 
realize I was, but I did it very nicely, very smiley. Um, but again, for him, he was feeling that criticism. So positive interaction means that we are either giving specific positive feedback, like you want goldfish crackers and you ask for them, yay, you rock star. Or we're just making comments because we value them. You are such a kind person. Or I love hanging out with you. This is a very powerful strategy to change behavior. And you can find all kinds of things if you just search online. Um, lots of different like prompts and ways you can kind of have some in your bank. How are, what are some things I can say that kind of build that five to one bank? Okay, so here is, we're going to move ahead into uh, responding to behavior. Um, with some very like planful next steps. So here's a visual of behavioral escalation. And many of you have probably seen this or similar models. Um, there's many models out there and they all look the same in that they have um, kids behavior kind of goes up that slope, rises up that slope, peaks at the top in what many of us have experienced as a full blown kind of meltdown crisis and then a, a de-escalation and a recovery. And so the scope of today's webinar doesn't allow us to get into that whole cycle or the really challenging behavior, but there are specific things that we can do down in the bottom left corner there of that cycle um, in the calm and in the trigger phases that can prevent further escalation for many kids. So phase one in this model is called calm. It's labeled different things. The label doesn't really matter, but this is where kids are um, engaged or they feel content, they're cooperative, they're just, you know what your kid looks like there, picture that. Picture when your child is in that phase. What do they look like? What do they sound like? Everything is good. And then I want you to picture what your child looks like or sounds like when you know they're just starting to get a little bit agitated or dysregulated. Some models call this rumbling. Uh, my friend Kelly um, calls it Houston, as in Houston, we have a problem. Um, these are small, kind of agitated, rumbly behaviors that are pretty easy to ignore or miss because they can be subtle, but parents certainly know them in their children, and most teachers um, recognize them in their students. Sometimes we see behavioral increases during rumbling, like you can see listed on the screen, like making noise and having busy hands. Um, I once worked with a boy who, his, one of his rumbly behaviors was he took off his socks and his shoes. And that was a pretty clear signal that Houston, we might have a problem. Um, or we see behavioral decreases, which are sometimes harder to pick up on, um, where kids might withdraw or just start not responding to questions or directions. So this is a really critical, important phase to step into as an adult, because this is the point where we have a really good shot at getting them back to that calm and engaged and cooperative state. Or the next step is that they move further up that escalation slope. Okay, so when you see these Houston type signals, we want to have three steps or strategies ready to go so that we can support our child or student and get them back to engaged without further escalation. That's the goal. Um, I have examples at each step of things you might do, but you would only pick three things total, one from each step. And these certainly is not a complete list of the strategies you could use. So for example, if my child was calm and engaged and was like picking up his toys and he was in kind of a happy place, and then I noticed some of the rumbling behavior starting, in that first list there, I might choose that I might provide help. I might say, let me get the closet open for you. And that might be just enough to re-engage him in picking up his toys. It might be just that little pushback into calm that he needed. If not, I'm gonna have step two ready. And in this example, I might choose that I'm going to reduce the task to a lower demand. So I'm going to, I might say, just pick up five for now, or you pick up five and I'll pick up five. Now, our human nature here is going to want to say, oh, but they need to do that. Remember, the goal here is to get them back to engaged and not have a power struggle. Um, now, if it doesn't work to get him back uh, to engaged, I've got step three here waiting. And in, um, this, in this uh, slide, I have two things. And typically when I am um, working um, with people on these plans, these are the two steps we tend to keep for this step three of this phase. And that is because um, it's very powerful, for example, to use a one more or just one more prompt. Because one more could mean 
you, I want you to pick up one more area of toys. Pick up the toys that, are, that you left in the kitchen um, or one more toy or one more piece of toy, like one Lego. I might be like, pick up one Lego and then we're, and we're good. So one more lets you have some parameters around what one is depending on how your child is at the moment. In class, it could be one more math row of problems. It could be one more problem. It could be right one number. Um, that's a really nice place to be able to kind of adjust the demand on the child. Remember, our goal is to get them back to engaged and cooperative and content. And another step in step three would be to offer a break. So break protocol would be a whole um, other webinar. But basically, think of break as a time with no demands. Your child is showing that he, he needs uh, to have demands lifted. Otherwise, um, escalation is imminent. And so it's a time with no demands just to regroup and to prevent further escalation. And it should not involve preferred activities. We should not give them their high love during, during break. Okay, um, I, just, I just made an example of this because one of the things that I love to do either for myself or when I'm working with um, families or educators is using scripts. Um, Scripts help, help us remember what to do and what to say when we start to get worried or scared or emotional and we aren't thinking the most clearly in the middle of behavior, right? So here I wrote down what I would do for each step that I just went over with you. If my son, um, let's say he was starting to show agitation when he was folding his clothes. So he was fine, all of a sudden he's just getting whatever, starting to show some Houston signs, he's folding his clothes. So what I had selected is for step one, I would increase my positive interaction with him. He's a competitive kind of kid, loves to kind of, you know, beat the clock, so to speak. So I might say, hey, let's see how fast you can do that. You know, this is awesome. You're, you're awesome. You're doing, you're doing it. And I would kind of engage with him and create that positive interaction. That might be enough to kick him back to being engaged and cooperative. If not, I'm going to go to step two where I'm going to reduce demands. So I've got this basket of clothes here and, or towels or whatever. And I might say, just do the dish towels. And then I'll say, that's a great help. Thank you. I'm closing that loop with feedback. Now he might be back to engaged. If not, I'm gonna pull out my one more. It fits in this example. I can, can say, just fold one more um, towel, one more whatever, and then you're done. Thanks, way to go. Again, the goal is not for him to do everything I want. The goal is to get him back to that engaged cooperative place where then we can uh, work on finishing tasks. So, uh, a rule of thumb, and Stacy um, showed this model to you uh, in a different context, but a rule of thumb is that um, we um, want to stop challenging behavior. Of course we do. We want it to just stop, right? And we, we can stop, let's say we stop spitting. Let's say your child's spitting or my child is spitting or hitting. We can stop that. But most of the time what happens is we see other behaviors start to occur in its place. And usually it's even bigger. <laughs> Um, so the rule of thumb is we always want to increase a pro-social behavior or teach a pro-social behavior while we're decreasing the challenging behavior. And so um, we want to think about uh, alternative behaviors that can be taught. So here would be the question for you to ask yourself, what pro-social behavior could be taught to replace this challenging behavior my kid has and still meet my child's need? So for example, if, it's, if you have a child, um, and I've certainly um, um, seen this, where a child yells and shouts when they're stuck on a task, right? They, they're stuck, they just start yelling and shouting. We might teach them to use a help card or to sign for help instead. Um, if they're hitting or pinching to get attention, we might teach them an alternative way to get attention, like maybe just a, a hand raise. Maybe there's a specific noise that your student can make that indicates that they want attention or a word. Um, and I would say that if you need support in teaching um, your child alternative behaviors to really um, replace those challenging behaviors, please reach out to any service providers your child may have, um, including like speech pathologists or social workers or be behavior analysts, school psychs, et cetera, OTs, um, as well as your child's teacher. All right. So that was fast and furious, I know. Um, we are going to go ahead and put up another poll. And these are all of the strategies that we um, have covered throughout um, today's session. So go ahead and again, you can do as many as you'd like, but what strategies from today are you planning to try? 
what sounds reasonable or doable for you or something that you think, oh, that's exciting. I really want to try that. What does that look like? Excited for this too. I love these polls, they're like a surprise. Oh, nice. Okay, so reminding of expectations and rules. Yeah, I'm so glad so many of you want to do that because you probably do it anyway. It's just being really mindful about that and recognizing effort. Oh, I love the, the five to one ratio. That is, that's a game changer. So that's exciting to see. And teaching alternative behaviors. I good, there's a little bit of everything. So uh, what that tells us is that hopefully everybody at least is walking in a way with, with something um, that they can try to implement. Thank you. Right, Stacy. Yeah. So I can't believe our hour is almost up, <laughs> our last hour. So um, as we're wrapping up today, um, we just want to reiterate how important it is to keep communicating with your child's school and school team as you try to navigate through, you know, return to school and integrating into school this fall. So use the teacher teens expectations and rules for desired behavior that we've talked about. Model and practice when your child makes mistakes. Um, remind, recognize, and reward for expected behavior and respond to behavioral errors with correction, redirection, si signal, and provide choices. Use high rates of positive um, to corrective actions as Stephanie just talked about. Recognize signal of ag agitation and respond according to a determined plan. So consider alternatives to challenging behavior and reach out for support if you need assistance with teaching the alternative behaviors. And I just wanna remind you that these uh, webinars have been recorded. So if you happen to miss one and there's a, there, one of these topics you haven't seen, um, they kind of build on each other. So I would encourage you to go back and, and look at them and, and um, maybe try to apply some of the, the, the information that we covered. So, and this is just um, a, a couple more resources um, to support teaching, reminding, reinforcing, and some of the behaviors, setting up reward systems at home. Um, this is a book I think we've talked about on the left before, and then um, Token Economies from um, Vanderbilt. There were quite a few uh, charts and apps and things listed um, that you can use. And we've talked about um, several times now um, because there's so much information on um, the pbas.org site. I wanted to reiterate again to go to the family location. And then APBS too is another great location to go find um, videos and information on positive uh, behavior interventions and supports and supporting your child at home. Um, and again, uh, Michigan Alliance for Families is on the left, and there's just a lot of information out there on PBA, PBIS and, and, and many other special education topics, and also Michigan Department of Education that um, talks about uh, M M I MTSS and many COVID resources and supporting your child at home too. So, um, and this is just a list of resources we've kind of built on um, and just encourage you to take a look at. And um, this wraps up, like I had mentioned in the beginning, our, our webinar series um, where we covered the recognizing, reminding, and rewarding, and then the challenging behaviors and strategies. Um, we are planning to do a panel, um, kind of a debrief on, on the series as far as the topics covered with professionals and uh, parents and um, some educators from various ISDs in Michigan. So we're just putting a final date together and and topics and we'll get more information out to the distribution for the webinars here shortly. So with that, um, we so appreciate your attending our, our webinars and um, giving us feedback and also just um, participating in the polls and hopefully we really hope that you can use some of the strategies that we've talked about. So um, if, if we could ask you to again, take the poll online, um, it, we do look at the results and it does help us design future training. So your, your feedback really, really matters. So thank you again and best of luck of you, with, to you and your return to school and, and maintaining your um, child's education this fall.